if you can hear me, we'll get started. I can hear you. Okay, so I apologize for the uh, change in training this week. Uh, Grandview actually canceled our special populations training. Um, so I'm working on getting that uh, reconfigured and rescheduled. So uh, this was a impromptu training that I put together or last couple or last night. Um, so we'd have something this week. Um, again, this is not going to be basic airway stuff. There's going to be some basic airway stuff, but this is going to be pretty much built off of, again, uh, things that we see on calls, things that we see through the QAQI process, uh, throughout the collaborative, and things that we uh, need to work on or see as uh, issues that we're having. Um, anybody can jump in at any point in time. Um, with any questions, comments, concerns, additional information, whatever, uh, shaning and bacon as well, uh, feel free to unmute and jump in. Um, this isn't gonna be extremely long at all. Um, it's about 22 slides, uh, but we'll uh, do quite a bit of uh, talking and discussion there. So um, as we jump through here, again, feel free to jump in and say whatever you wanna say. I can advance the slides here, hold on. Uh, so just an overview of what we're gonna hit on. We're gonna hit on a little bit of assessment, uh, some of the anatomy of the different parts of the airway. Uh, I wanna talk about adjuncts a little bit, um, what we are using, how we should be using those, when we should be using those. Um, talk uh, a little bit about innovation and about STI, um, the use of our auto vents, and then we're gonna talk just briefly about uh, surgical crikes and how we're going to introduce those into the collaborative here, hopefully by the first of the year for everybody. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about those as well. So first on your assessments. Um, one thing that I think in general, in EMS, especially in this area, is that we don't necessarily do a real good primary impression, general impression, or initial assessment on our airways. And ongoing wise and throughout transport, we do a fairly good job and we normally catch everything and manage airways really well. But that initial look at airways, that from the door look, um, I think we, uh, we just generally in this area can do a better job on. What I mean by that is a lot of times I think we walk through a door and we don't recognize when someone is necessarily in severe distress. Uh, severe di distress. Going back to that general impression angle of things is how many times do we walk in a door and look at somebody and say uh, they need innovated or they need put on CPAP right now or they're struggling really badly. We see a lot of times reviewing reports that we notice airway issues, we document airway issues well, but we don't necessarily tackle those issues immediately. And understanding the, the, the need to tackle those airway issues as quick as possible. So just when we're doing those assessments, are we coming in and doing that rapid scan of the patient and of the scene to see exactly what's going on? Do we realize when people are tripoding, when they've got barrel chest, when they're cyanotic? Um, one of the other things that we see quite a bit of is um, utilizing your AVPU assessment and your GCS to really help gauge you and how we and what we should be doing with our airways. Um, Rapid respirations, um, do we, are we really getting good counts and, and a good assessment on, on people's re respiratory rates? Um, do we notice things like accessory muscle use, um, chest muscle use, um, nasal flaring in these individuals? Um, and are we documenting them? Um, that's, that's the other factor in this, is, is documenting all those pertinent negatives and those assessment findings as we find them. Skin color and, and condition and temperature, 
um, is something else that factors into this greatly. Um, and then along with audible breath sounds and patterns. Um, and I'm not saying we don't do a good job. We do do a really good job. Again, I'll just go back to the QAQI angle is we hit a lot of times. We find a lot of things on the airway end um, that people leave out of reports. They may be doing, but they may not be documenting. Or one of the other things we'll find a lot is people are documenting one thing that they come in and give a general impression and do an initial assessment on an airway on a patient, but we're not tackling something that, is, that may be dire for that patient immediately. We're waiting to move them, get them out to a medic, and then do a procedure where tackling that airway may be uh, a need in the house immediately as you approach that patient. Um, and then also one of those other assessment findings is you understanding and using capnography and pulse ox. Um, there's several different, uh, just on, on, on my end, you know, most of uh, my experience from seeing in the collaborative have been from our shift, but we've also seen it. Um, I think we've all uh, worked other shifts that we've seen different things or read other reports where we can see those findings in there. So I go back to the assessment and just being able to make sure that when we walk through a door, we're doing that from the door assessment of these patients and we're able to make good assessments and good decisions on how we should be tackling that airway and understanding when someone is in dire distress. If I have someone, you walk into a house and all of a sudden you get pushed back through the door with cigarette smoke and they're tripoded over, they're pale, uh, maybe cyanotic, uh, they've got a respiratory rate of 40, well, and they're on home oxygen, that's an airway that we need to tackle right now. Um, that individual uh, cannot sustain their ventilatory rate like they are. Um, that isn't someone that we should be picking up, putting on a cot, wheeling all the way out to the medic, and then putting on CPAP. That's something we should be doing inside the house. And that's what I'm getting to with that assessment angle. And uh, above and beyond what we just went over with those, those physical characteristics that we see, along with that, we also need to make sure we're concentrating on their history, finding out as much of their history as possible, either from them, family members, or even what we're seeing around the house. You know, if they're on home oxygen, that should tell us a lot. Um, if, uh, if they're that uh, barrel chest or that, that pink puffer, like that previous picture, that pink puffer or that blue bloater, um, that should tell us a lot about those, those individuals as well. So understanding what their history is, getting a good history on that patient, um, even recent history, have they had uh, known infections or sepsis? Uh, we've had uh, several sepsis patients uh, in the past several months that we've had to tackle airways on, that we've had to innovate and secure airways on because they've been so progressed and they're, and they're so septic. Um, also, previous innovations, we'll see that a lot of times. Uh, for the Clayton people, uh, the individual that we had over here in Michelle Court for the longest time. Um, we knew that if that address came out that we had innovated him several times and if we were going there, there was a good possibility he was gonna be innovated again. So um, understanding the history, getting that history is gonna help you along that way with your assessments as well deeply. So don't, don't disregard the history because the history can help you out tremendously. Um, and along, I, the other thing I kind of threw in this assessment angle is that initial, initial treatment, going back to what I said before, is what do we need to do to that patient now, initially, as we walk in? Does positioning help? Do we have someone that's laying flat? Um, I, I bring up uh, all of our different extended care facilities, and if we have individuals that are on trachs, um, what's their positioning like? A lot of times with those individuals, we'll go on them and they've got low O2 stats. And yeah, it can be a suctioning issue. Yeah, it can be another issue, but sometimes it's just a positioning issue. They got turned in their bed, they got set up too much, laid down too much, and they seem to be positioned better and we can fix that immediately. The use of oxygen and getting them, getting them on oxygen immediately, whether that is by a mask, nasal cannula, or CPAP or bagging those individuals. Um, something else we see a whole lot of is um, we'll have uh, an initial airway assessment documented as someone breathing, um, you know, whether it's six times a minute or 40 times a minute, and 
uh, we document skin condition as, as pale, maybe cyanotic, um, and we don't do an initial treatment on them right away. So understanding when we walk in and see that airway assessment that we see and how we're going to manage that immediately. And then we have an ongoing assessment and treatment of that patient. Um, but we shouldn't be holding back and delaying some of those initial treatments for these patients, which we see a lot of times within documentation. Uh, for bacon and uh, shaning, is there anything else on the assessment end that you two can think of that we've noticed throughout the QA, QI process that we want to throw in there? So what I will say is we're not doing a great job of documenting when we're pre-oxygenating patients prior to intubation. Uh, we're leaving stuff out of the flow chart in the Englewood case of, you know, we're saying in the narrative we were bagging them and then we tube them, but we're not documenting fully that we actually did take the time to pre-oxygenate the patient prior to intubating. Um, the other issue is that I, I still have people that go on calls and document as their primary impression that respiratory distress is what this patient's main thing is, and, and we're still not utilizing capnography every time we have some sort of respiratory complaint. Two very good points. Um, capnography end, again, that's gonna help you, I think, back here. I think one of the things was, yeah, audible breath sounds and patterns. So um, that's another thing when it comes back to your documentation and when you're doing those assessments is those patterns and caponography is gonna help you out with that. Uh, we had one on this shift just, uh, I think it was last shift or the shift before, um, where uh, I think it was at 1010 Taywood. Uh, where caponography readings were in the teens, you know, that all, all those factors are going to play into that initial assessment or should be, and should be quick and easy assessment tools for us to look at and manage those fairly quickly. And uh, the other point of shanings there is making sure that whether it's in the procedures, the flow chart, and in your narrative, that we're documenting that progression of exactly everything we're doing. And that goes through protocol, that goes through standard of care. First we did this, then we did this, then we progressed to this. So yes, all the initial steps need to be in there as well. One other thing is please bear in mind that when we do have CHF and COPD patients that are presenting with an acute infection, uh, to not get tunnel vision on the fact that they do have COPD and CHF. Uh, having sepsis when you already have the comorbidities of, of heart disease and, and respiratory illnesses uh, can, can further make sepsis worse. And there is a good probability that their acute respiratory distress is not nearly uh, as well based on the fact that they have CHF or COPD, but it's, it's the acute infection it's that they've been on antibiotics and they have a UTI and it, it's making their COPD or their CHF worse. So, Another good point. Very much so. Uh, the anatomy angle of things. Um, something else, and this doesn't go back so much to documentation, but it does, but um, this goes back to your initial uh, assessment of these patients as well. Um, and I'll go back to this and just airway, managing airway in general, but uh, specifically towards innovation is that we have to understand that um, there's all different kinds of anatomies out there. And you know, I throw all kinds of pictures up on the screen there, but you know, whether you're dealing with the no neck or the obese patient, or that individual that may have some type of kyphosis um, or a, a long neck, um, you know, all of those should play into thinking, if I've got to innovate this patient, what are the hurdles that I'm gonna to have to overcome? everything from a setback jaw to an underbite to an overbite um, to massive facial trauma. Um, you know, we talking this morning again about the crash out on Haber Road from the other week, uh, which uh, the crews managed, which the crews managed very well. Um, but uh, when it comes to an airway, you know, that individual had made a pretty significant facial trauma. So if I know a care flight ended up intubating this patient, I believe, but um, 
if that would have been one we were going to have to manage prior to them getting there, we have to think about those things and understand what the obstacles that are going to present themselves to us are. Are we going to be able to orally innovate them? Can we nasally innovate them? Do we have to do a, a surgical crike? What are the different options for us? And what are the different tools we have to do that? So that's the biggest reason why I want to throw the anatomy thing in here. And it does go back to the assessment is when I walk in, if we walk into somebody and I have the individual at the top left of the screen, and I'm going to have to secure that individual's airway. And I know that the minute I walk through the door, that's going to pre present challenges to us. And do I have everything I need in place to manage those challenges? Um, so the anatomy, all those airways, there's no airway that's going to be 100% the same as somebody else's airway. Um, you have uh, everything from, you know, I, and you can have, I call it hamburger airway. You get in and these individuals have different diseases or they're, they're morbidly obese and they have you know, what looks like hamburger filling their oral pharynx. Uh, that can be a challenge for you. So we put several tools in place to help us manage through these different anatomies. Um, so uh, visually assessing uh, what you are dealing with and being able to uh, make determinations early so we don't get in there and waste more time in trying to secure an airway or manage someone's airway. Um, we provide through the entire collaborative, uh, just about every tool we have available to us airway wise. And I'm always willing to look at and throw forward more, more tools for that uh, to make it easier for us, better for us and to manage anything that comes, presents it to, or, uh, itself to us. Um, seeing everything from people asking about glide scopes to um, uh, Bumax blades to lighted stylets. So some things we don't have that we will look look at towards the future to help us with some of these situations. But also think outside the box and critically think with these. And we're going to talk a little bit here and a little bit about different uh, uh, tools of the trade, tricks of the trade to help you manage some of these airways as well. Um, just a, a generalized uh, reminder, review of what those airways look like. So I can tell you a lot of times, and we see this a lot with, with newer medics or students, um, that uh, when we, especially when we go in to innovate somebody, um, a lot of times I think that they forget about what the basic structures of, that ana of the anatomy of the airway are and exactly what that's gonna look like and not what it's gonna look like here on the screen uh, and a side cutout of the airway, but what it's gonna look like when they're laying supine and you're at their head going in their mouth with a laryngoscope blade, understanding what blade you're using, how that blade works within that airway and the structures within that airway. You know, between a Miller blade, a Mac blade, and a King vision, what occurs with the epiglottis? What needs to happen with the epiglottis? Where's that epiglottis located? Um, what's the nasal pharynx and the oral pharynx? You know, those are, those are different. If we're gonna end up doing a nasal innovation, you truly have to understand how the nasal pharynx, nasal pharynx, oral pharynx works together. And exactly when I'm going in with a nasal tube or an endotrol to do a, to do a nasal innovation, what do I have to accomplish there? Why does that have a, a, a finger loop on it so I can control the tip of that, that tube? Uh, once you understand the anatomy a little bit better and can picture that anatomy in your head, it makes it a little bit easier for you to manage that airway and secure that airway when you need to. Along that same lines, when we're dealing with OPAs and MPAs, different adjuncts, how is that working? What's the, the purpose of those? Um, how is it uh, maintaining an open airway for you? And truly understanding that structure is going to help you understand that. If we've got to place a, a rescue airway, a king, a king airway, or a LMA, um, what does that look like? Where do the different parts of those tools go when we're blind sticking those rescue airways, those superglottic airways? Um, and understanding where the tip of that LMA is, is 
hopefully being placed where the tip of that king airway and where the cuffs in that king airway, where they're inflating and what the goal of that king airway is to do. Um, if you don't understand the anatomy and those tools, then it's gonna make it very, very difficult for you to manage that airway. So having that basic understanding and remember the basic understanding of the airway is going to be your best option. Uh, just a little bit of a review of the uh, Mel and Patty scale uh, of your different airways you can deal with. And once again, this goes back to, <laughs> thank you, JC. Um, this goes back to uh, uh, assessing that airway prior to doing anything and understanding that you've got different makeups, different body styles, different airways. Uh, between that class one, that grade one to that grade five and a class one, um, I'm sorry, grade one to grade four and class one to class four um, when you're looking at that airway because that is what's going to determine and should determine how we're going to manage that airway, how we're going to secure that airway. Um, I had a conversation the other night with a new paramedic about blades, which we'll get into here in a minute, is I know we all have a blade that we're comfortable with and like and are, is our go-to blade when it comes to innovation, and that's fine. Uh, but understand that a Macintosh blade may not work every patient. I'm a big fan. I, I, I am a, I, my go-to is a Grandview blade. Um, that Grandview blade is not going to work on every patient. It works on a majority of the ones, and that's what I'm most comfortable with, and that's what I've had most success with. But I have to understand <clears throat> that that big, fat blade is not going to work on every airway. Just like <clears throat> a Macintosh, a Mac 4 is not going to work on every airway. So even though that you may have your Miller 4 as your go-to, it may not work on every patient and you've got to understand the mechanics and how to work those different blades. So that's where this comes into play and understanding what you're looking at and how that is going to affect the different styles of tools that we have for you to manage that airway. Just a couple little different, uh, there's all kinds of different uh, tricks, tools, mnemonics out there uh, when it comes to, just like anything in EMS, uh, but when it comes to airway, there's the whole uh, LEMON acronym to help you assess airways. Um, so virtually looking externally, kind of like what we're talking about before is, does that person have a short neck, a fat neck, a long neck? Uh, do they have um, uh, do they have a do they have kyphosis? I mean, different things that you're looking at. Do they have an overbite, underbite? Different things that could affect that. That's that L, that look externally. That evaluate, which is the three three two method. That's utilizing. That's the picture that you're seeing on. If you're looking at the screen, the right side of the screen, um, and it's virtually. Are you able to get three fingers in the mouth? Are there three fingers from the virtually the tip of the chin down to the um, hyoid bone. And do you have, can you get two finger distance between the hy hyoid and uh, a bit below the hyoid down to the, the, the cricoid cartilage? Um, if, if all those are the case, you should have a fairly easy innovation. If those numbers are less than that, then you could have a more difficult innovation. Uh, just got done talking about the melon poly potty scale. Uh, what that airway looks like with their mouth wide open and their tongue out. Are you able to see the back? Are you able to see the molecula? Um, or are you not able to see any of it at all? So again, class one and two should be a fairly easy innovation. Once you get to a three and four class, you are going to have a higher degree of difficulty with that airway. Um, o is uh, obstruction or obesity. Once again, um, understanding some of their history. Um, do they have anatomy issues within their oral pharynx? Uh, have they had throat cancer? Uh, have they uh, had any type of um, uh, neck surgeries or neck issues that, or, or foreign bodies or trauma that was going to make that difficult? And then the last one is that neck mobility. And this goes back into kyphosis or neck issues or trauma or what is their ability to flex their neck, hyperextend their neck? Um, 
the less neck mobility you have, the more difficulty you're going to have with that innovation. And I'll throw this one in here that we'll talk about here at the end of this training and just kind of going into anatomy when we're dealing with surgical, surgical crikes. Um, understanding where the thyroid cart cartilage is, what it looks like, how to pick it out, the cricoid cartilage, same thing, and the cricoid membrane. Um, if you can pick out those three structures within for a surgical crike, um, that's going to help you out tremendously to affect that procedure. Uh, you have to know where the, the, that anatomy is and be able to point that anatomy out, pick that anatomy out, mark that anatomy out in order to do that surgical crike. So we'll come back to this uh, here towards the end, but uh, since we're talking about anatomy, that's why I threw it in here. Um, so again, before we move on to the next area of this, is there anything on anatomy that anybody else can think of or want to throw into this? And don't forget, you got partners laying around too, as far as helping you with, you know, pressure and uh, uh, other options for raising the shoulders up. There's different, you know, street type techniques. Uh, you're not just limited to uh, cranking and throwing a tube in. You you got more options than that. Correct, and that's one thing I hit here in a little bit is more of those tricks of the trades, different ways to uh, aid you in and in getting those innovations. But um, yeah, absolutely, and it goes back along that same thing is it's not just the paramedics that need to know this anatomy. Um, when your EMT partner, I tell you that I need some cricoid pressure, I need cricoid pressure, and you have to understand where that is, how to give that, what kind of pressure I'm looking for. Um, I'm not looking for you to shut down their airway, I'm looking for you to give me pressure to, to virtually uh, help me guide that airway into place so, so that we can innovate. Um, so yeah, 100% on that. There are different tricks to trade, and that goes back into knowing that anatomy and, and how to overcome that stuff. Going to adjuncts a little bit. Uh, so this is another issue um, that I, I think we're probably about 50, 50, 60, 40 to the good on. Um, I think a lot of times when we're all bad at this is that we fail to utilize adjuncts like we should per protocol, per standard of care. Um, anytime we're bagging a patient, we, have, we need to make sure we're throwing in an adjunct. Um, so when we should use those, well, truly anytime that we're going to assist ventilations, we need to assure that we've got an adjunct in place. Um, they're quick, they're easy, they shouldn't be a problem. So uh, when we should use these, who we should use these on, uh, again, um, any patient that we're going to have to manage an airway on, um, whether that be an overdose patient that we're bagging prior to giving Narcan and, and getting respirations back, uh, whether that's uh, a, a patient that's got a GCS of less than eight that can't man manage their airway that we're managing, um, you know, a patient that's breathing too fast, too slow, doesn't matter. Anybody we're going to manage an airway on, we need to make sure we've got an adjunct on. And once again, it does us no good to bag a patient while they're laying supine if we're not putting an, an oral adjunct in their mouth to, in their oral pharynx to hold their tongue up off of the back of their airway. Um, we are not effectively and efficiently ventilating that patient unless we have an adjunct in place. Semi-conscious patient, again, with our NPAs, um, utilizing the, the, the same function to where we're, we're creating a pathway to the trachea uh, in order to supply that oxygenated air to. Um, so understand that the OPAs are actually holding the tongue uh, up off of the back of the airway and allowing that flow of air to go down to the trachea. NPAs are providing that through the nasal pharynx uh, down to the area of the trachea to maintain that open airway. Uh, I really only have one slide on that. Um, and once again, anybody else can jump in and give any information they want to on that. Remember the basics of how we insert these and utilize these uh, with 
lube with your NPAs and uh, bevel towards the septum and rotating in uh, if need be. Um, how you measure them. Uh, that's the, the other thing is a lot of times I think, uh, and not to say that we, we can't get pretty confident of, well, I know it's this size patient, so I need this. Uh, but understand the measurement of, of OPAs and NPAs are a little bit different. OPAs are from the corner of the mouth to the ear, NPAs are from the nose, the, 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 the nostril to the earlobe. You got that, Chief? Thanks. Chief Fall, still yes. I think a, a, another thing, too, is just being such a BLS skill, if it's done up front and early enough, uh, it really kind of jump starts your assessment for your airway stuff based on your patient's responsiveness. So if your patient takes an OPA right out of the gate, uh, you kind of know the direction that you can start down as far That's as your a very good point. Needing a two versus if they, you know, if they're struggling to get an NPA in, then you know you, you can probably go the other route of maybe just managing it with BVM and, and until you get, you know, whatever they try to your H's and T's and all that other good stuff to figure so out your assessment stuff. Yeah. Very, so, very good point. Other than just go straight to, yeah, straight to the accommodate and loading them up, you know, you can see what yeah, you got. Utilizing, utilizing as an assessment tool is absolutely a, 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 good, a good point on this. So let's talk a little bit about innovation. So uh, obviously we lost 99's crew, but that's okay. Um, uh, innovation on, on, on our patients. I, I will tell you that I am, I am very happy with um, our rate of innovation, our success, success of innovation. Um, even for the most part, assessment of our patients and realizing what patients need an airway. Um, need a secured airway. So the first thing I do want to say on that is that we do still see some within the QAQI process and even when we're on calls of people that uh, we're not um, innovating when we should. Um, it's, it's not the majority, it's definitely the minority of, of calls, but we still have those. So that's one of the reasons why um, I thought this was a, a good train to do today to kind of try to um, push people more towards the right direction when it comes to assessment and realizing who we need, who we should be innovating. So there's a couple factors there that we should always be looking at. Um, number one is that inadequate respirations on people. Right, let me just, I'll, I'll put it all together by saying inadequate respirations, oxygenation, or, and or ventilation. Um, any of those factors, should be pushing us and at least it popping into our mind that there's a good possibility I may need to innovate this patient at some point in time during um, our, our interaction. Uh, the biggest part of that is making sure that we're realizing it, realizing it early and dealing with it as early as possible. The longer these individuals go without a uh, inadequate respirations without the appropriate amount of oxygenation and without uh, the appropriate ventilation, um, then the worse off they're going to become throughout that transport. The quicker we can manage that, the better off those patients are going to be. Um, so respirations, oxygenation, and ventilation become important there and understanding the difference of those three. Along with that is something that I hit on a lot is your APU and your GCS. And I'll go back to QAQI and documentation, and it's documenting those things. If we see someone that's got a, a GCS of six, seven, five, four, you know, eight and under, uh, anytime I see a GCS of eight and under, I'm always wondering why I either, why I don't see an innovation or I'm looking to see some type of airway management with, with that patient. 
um, initial airway management, and then eventually to securing that airway on that patient if they maintain in that level of responsiveness. Um, if those individuals have a GCS of less than eight or are only um, alert to you know, painful stimuli, those individuals can't necessarily, can't necessarily um, manage their own airway. So a lot of times what we'll see documented is patient's rate, quality of respirations were good, but they had a GCS of six. Well, their rate and quality may be fine. They may be oxygenating okay. They may be ventilating okay. But one thing they can't do if they're unconscious is be able to manage and clear their airway if they were to start to vomit or if they were, if they were to start to get copious amounts of fluid in their airway we have to be able to manage that. The best way we have to manage that is to secure their airway. So that GCS factor plays into that. So those four factors are probably the biggest factors that we look at and we all should be looking at when we're assessing those patients. Are the respirations appropriate? Are they oxygenating and ventilating appropriately? And I go back to those assessment tools we have again. You have caponography. You have... Um, uh, pulse oximetry, you have uh, a monitor, you have stethoscopes, all that stuff is there to help you out to determine whether those factors are happening or not. So uh, I go back to, we do, a, we do a fairly good job here, you know, um, not only with innovating, but the success of our innovations. Uh, however, we do see that that is happening with a couple uh, key people. Uh, I know Becker's probably watching this right now. He's probably got the highest innovation count and success rate within the collaborative. Um, I think there's several people that can innovate, know how to innovate, uh, but you know he, he is somebody that can walk in the door and say, yeah, that person needs innovated and be able to do that effectively. Um, that's what we're looking to accomplish with everybody. Um, is to have that rate of innovation and uh, idea of walking in, doing an assessment and saying, yeah, their airway needs secured. So just a couple factors there when it comes to who needs to be innovated, how they need to be innovated. Probably the biggest thing that I think we miss most on, I mean, it's, it's easy to innovate someone that's not breathing. Uh, it, it's an easy assessment to say, okay, this person's in full arrest, they need innovated. On the critical thinking end of thing, it's not so much when we're walking into that COPD patient and say, do they need CPAP or are they too far past that to where I need to innovate them? Um, it's not uh, one of the other, the, the other times we see this is when we walk in and, you know, we have someone that's got a GCS of three, a four or five, and we're trying to manage through an assessment to try to figure out what's wrong with this person going down, what are the treatable causes, and eventually we have to understand that if we can't reverse what's going on with that patient, we need to be working towards an innovation and managing the airway at the same time. So just because we're working through treatable causes on that patient um, doesn't mean we don't need to put an adjunct in that patient and bag that patient. Um, and then once we can't find a treatable cause that's going to reverse this, then we need to go in and make sure we're moving towards securing that airway. Um, just a little review here of what protocol states about airway management, uh, your appropriate rates for your different age groups and what we should be ventilating them at, what their respiratory rate should be. Um, just hitting on some of the things we've already hit on, making sure you're using an adjunct, uh, making sure that uh, truly two attempts and then we should move to a rescue airway. And I'll talk a little bit of, more about that here in a little bit. Um, but uh, down towards the bottom of that, you'll see when deciding whether to innovate, consider the following. So insufficient respirations, um, irregular respiratory rhythms, abnormal breath sounds, inadequate chest expansion, uh, respiratory depth, uh, excessive effort to breathe, use of accessory muscles, nasal flaring, cyanosis,
cardiac dysrhythmias, and then it'll go back to level of consciousness uh, in there as well. Um, and then confirming placement, which we can talk about as well, which we do a, we do a really good job about uh, documenting tube, tube placement. Like we've pounded that home enough that everyone pretty much hits that for the most part. Uh, my only thing is, is are we checking boxes or are we actually doing those things? So it's one thing to document it, but make sure that we're actually doing those things too. I know that we're using caponography, but just because we have caponography doesn't mean we don't have to listen for breath sounds. We want to make sure we don't have belly sounds. We want to make sure that we're both left and right and not right main stem. So make sure we're doing all of those things that we're actually documenting. So let's go into a couple of the, the tools uh, that we have available to us. Talked a little bit earlier about blades and understanding the, the function and how to utilize those blades. Big difference between a Miller and a Mac blade. Um, Mac blade is actually going in front of the um, epiglottis and is lifting the epiglottis by using uh, backward and upward pressure. And when it does that, it virtually, it should flip the epiglottis up towards you and allow you vision of the vocal cords. Where a Miller blade, and I'll even go to a Grandview blade because that's just a bigger Miller blade, with some exceptions. Um, those are actually designed to grab the epiglottis and lift it up out of the way. Um, again, I don't, I don't care what you use. Um, everybody is comfortable with what they've got. Um, I would say majority of people like Macintosh blades. I'm a Miller person. I like to actually black, grab, be able to grab the um, epiglottis and get it up out of the way. Uh, above and beyond that, I said that I'm a Grandview person. The reason why I like the Grandview blade is because in my experience, the tongue is normally the biggest obstacle when it comes to vision within the oral pharynx. So if I'm able to come in and completely with that big fat blade, scoop that tongue completely up and out of the way and encompass as much as that tongue as possible, I have a better view of the airway. I'm not saying you should use it, shouldn't use it, Use what you're comfortable with, but understand that there's going to be times that I'm not going to be able to use that Grandview blade. There's been times I've had to take that Grandview blade off and go to a Mac blade. There's been times I've had to take it off and go to a Miller blade because that because a Miller four is a little bit longer than a Grandview blade. Um, understand your tools, how to utilize them, and what their drawbacks are and what their benefits are because each one of those tools, those blades is going to be different. And one blade is not going to work on every patient you deal with. Um, so understand those. If you haven't played around with the different uh, tools, the different blades, make sure you play around with the different blades. Um, they're, they're very beneficial tools in their own right. Um, just make sure that you understand that. Someone that's more anterior, you may need a Miller blade. Um, someone that's uh, obese or has a huge tongue, you may need a Grandview blade. So just understand those different mechanisms, how to use them and practice with them all. Um, King vision. You know, we had a problem with King visions for a while that people, um, again, didn't quite understand the mechanism of how that blade worked on the King visions, um, that you didn't have to necessarily bury the blade in their mouth. Um, you know, just getting that in someone's mouth can be a, uh, can be, it can be hard at times. Um, so understanding that you can actually turn that blade on its side, uh, to turn, to get it in their mouth and bring it up and then rotate it up and around with all of these blades, whether it's the King vision or a Miller or a Mac or a Grandview. The other thing that we see a lot of times watching people innovating is they're coming straight down into the mouth and trying to slide down along the tongue. Um, that, that is a, a, a bad habit that first off can push the tongue further back down into the airway and get it in your way. The other thing that it can do is if those individuals have any type of substance to their tongue, it's going to envelop a standard blade. So if you go on with a Miller blade, it's not going to do you any good because all you've done is turn their tongue into a taco around your blade. Um, 
remember that when we're coming in with innovation blades, we need to come in from the right side of the mouth and sweep the tongue over to the left side, um, pushing everything off to the left side of the mouth and giving you a clear view and tunnel with your right hand to be able to go in with a tube to those vocal cords. Uh, bougies. Uh, we have bougies, tube introducers, whatever you want to call them. Um, they are a good tool. I've actually seen um, people use them recently and with success, uh, but they've got their limitations as well. But they, they're they a tool there to help you secure that airway, whether it is a blind insertion, whether it is an insertion aided with a laryngoscope blade. There's all different kinds of ways you can use a bougie. Understand it's design and, and, and purpose as well. That is designed and why it's got that hockey stick like angle at the end is for you to introduce into the trachea and be able to slide back and forth and feel the ridges of that trachea with that hockey stick end. That way you know at that point in time that you're in the trachea and not the esophagus. So one good example of this is if you had someone that was extremely anterior and you have that melon potty of a, of a class four and you're in there with your laryngoscope blade and you've got your, your, your epiglottis um, either grabbed and, and, and pushed up or, or grabbed with your Macintosh blade and flipped up and you still cannot see any of the airway. Um, this would be a good time to take your tube introducer, or your bougie, and be able to go up blindly and see if you can get into that trachea. And then once you're, you think you're into that trachea, being able to slide back and forth and feeling those ribbed ridges of the trachea. Once you've done that, now you're in the trachea, you leave your bougie in place and slide your tube right over it. And now you've virtually done a blind insertion of a ET tube, of a bougie in an ET tube, and you were able to accomplish securing that airway. Uh, King Vision, once again, uh, that is a tool that takes some practice with to understand the, to understand the correct mechanics of how that should operate. Um, one thing I will say is you don't always have to go in first with the laryngoscope blade. You don't always have to go in first with a King Vision. I'm saying assess your patient, like we said at the very beginning of this, and say, if I have that individual with no neck that's 400 pounds, it is probably in my best interest not to go in with a Mac 4 blade. It's probably my best interest not to go in with a Grandview blade. It's probably my best interest at that point in time to utilize the tools I have available to me, being the King Vision, and get an airway quicker than messing around in the airway two attempts with a uh, with a laryngoscope blade because there's so there's so much adipose tissue there and everything else within their airway where that's going to be a difficult airway utilize the tools we have available for us for those difficult airways and the last one I'll talk about here is nasal pharyngeal airways nasal tubes is this isn't something that I discourage I think it's still a good practice and a good tool to have available for us but it should not be truly our first or second line for an innovation. Um, it is a great tool for something like uh, one of the, the airway pictures you saw earlier of the person with the jaw wired shut. That would be my primary go-to on something like that if I needed to innovate a person. I will also say this is a lost art with a lot of people. Um, for us out there that have been doing this for 15, 20 years, um, this was nasal innovations or something we did all the time on our, on our semi-conscious patients. Prior to us having paralytics or automate or STI or RSI procedures, um, nasal innovations are something we did all the time. So we have some, um, some practice with those, some experience with those, but this is something truly that um, as we move forward in one of the other trainings we have scheduled this year is an airway competence course, um, an airway challenge course, this will be one of those that's in there is to make sure everyone understands the mechanics and how a nasal pharyngeal airway should work and what tools you need to have in place to make that happen. Um, let's see here. 
We already talked about how most airways, all airways are not the same. One tool is not going to work on every airway. Start with the best tool of the job. And it goes back to that initial thing we said is assess your person, assess your airway. What difficulties am I going to have? And go in with your best chance. Um, the whole goal, remember, when we're talking about innovation is we want to be in and out of there in 10 to 15 seconds. It's pre-oxygenate your patient, come off, go in with your, your tool, whatever it's going to be, and be able to pass a tube quickly and seamlessly. Um, obviously, we can run into issues, and that's not a problem. But understand that that 15-second mark is truly what we're looking for. Um, and if we're in there for longer than that, we need to make sure that we're backing out, backing out and, and re-oxygenating the patient with a bag valve mask. And those are things we need to make sure we're documenting. There's nothing wrong with not being able to get the airway. We need to make sure we're documenting that we did the correct things if we weren't able to get the, the airway in a timely manner. Uh, another thing is don't hesitate to bow out. Um, you know, we, we, I think a lot of us do our best to try to give people with uh, less experience, new medics, to try to get in and get airways, and that's great. I think that's something we need to do. Um, but that is probably also the person we don't wanna put on the person that we come in and say, ooh, they're gonna be a difficult airway. <laughs> I put in there, and this is kind of a joke, but sometimes number one uh, must step up, or you know, that, that person that's the best person innovating, sometimes needs to be the person that is up there innovating um, because you know it's a lot of times we're using this these things as on the job training and practice and that's fine and that that really is fine but understand that um, sometimes it's just best to let the person that has the most experience on something that has the potential of being difficult to jump in there and get it done also if you've gone in and you're having problems don't sit there and try two and three times. Get someone else in there and let them have a shot at it. Uh, once again, different experience levels, uh, different comfortability le levels. Um, not that you should go in once and give up. That's not what I'm saying. But I, I, I really throw throw out that term. Don't hesitate to bow out. Um, there's there's <laughs> even even though we may bust you a little bit afterwards, there's no shame in that. I'd rather you bow out and us get the airway than us not. So just those different factors there of look at what you got. If you're having problems, bow out, let someone else get in there. Um, so some tricks of the trade, which we talked about a little bit earlier, and there's a, there's a pretty good uh, true visualization of grade one through grade four when we're talking about the melopotty scale and what you're going to see when it comes to vocal cords. Um, you know, that grade one should be pretty easy, even that grade two, pretty easy. You get to that grade three and four, those may be, you know, blind insertions or using some of these other tricks of the trade to help you get a better view of that airway. <laughs> um, so some tricks of the trade. First off, proper technique. Um, I talked a little bit about it earlier making sure we're coming in using the appropriate tool, coming in at the right side of the mouth and actually sweeping the tongue up and out of the way. Um, I call it a head drop procedure. You know, if you're actually on the cot innovating, being able to pull that individual up so their head falls off the back of the cot, um, using, using gravity to your advantage there, uh, getting them in that hyper, hyper extended as much as possible, bring that airway into view. Cricoid pressure. Um, remember that cricoid pressure should be down and up pressure and not so much pressure to where we're slamming everything off, um, but down and up pressure uh, to able to bring that airway, help bring that airway into interview. Um, the arm lift procedure where you've got someone on either side of the patient, each grab an arm and virtually lift their shoulders up off the ground. And again, this is goes back to that head drop and allows their their head to fall back as much as possible uh, to really open up that airway. Um, lay the patient flat. Another thing I think a, a lot of times and one of the makeups of our cot that I don't like is, is all the crap that we put behind the head of the cot and, and not to mention the, the uh, oxygen cylinder is there a lot of times. Um, but the more we can get them flat, the better off a lot of times you're going to be. Um, 
And then along with that, you know, talked a little bit about nasal innovations. Understand that nasal innovations, when you go to do a nasal innovation, that position of the head is not always going to be hyperextended. You know, a lot of times that's going to have to be more neutral in order to be able to pass that tube to where we need to put it. Tube shape and manipulation. This is something else I had a conversation about uh, the other day with a new paramedic was, you know, uh, one of the things I think they teach you a lot in school is your, your tube should have that uh, J shape or that hockey stick, hockey stick shape, where that's not always the truth. Um, there's a big difference between a J and a hockey stick. And then there's a big difference between a, a C and a J. And there's a big difference between a straight tube. All of those, your, your manipulation of your tube uh, as you're going into uh, innovate is tremendously important. If you look at the picture, a grade one, I could virtually put in with a straight tube almost, or a hockey stick, I will say, where a grade three or four, I may have to have more of a modified hockey stick or a J or a C. Um, being able to uh, manipulate and modify your tube to help you out here is tremendously important. Once again, that just all comes with experience and being able to do that stuff. Suction, suction, suction. Uh, I think a lot of people try to go in. I, I, I think probably, I, I'm going to say 90% of the patients that I've innovated, I'm going to say that I've suctioned prior to. Because even if it's not vomitous, you still just have secretions that can block your view. Uh, like you've got in the grade four picture there, you can see the kind of the secretions up at the top where the tip of the, the laryngoscope blade is. That, that frothy crap in there can block your view. Just suction it out. That's just going to make, make it that much easier for you to get that tube. And then blind insertions. We talked about utilizing your bougies, utilizing, um, I, I, I'm not a, not a big fan of digital innovations, but um, all the all the little tricks and different methods we have out there, utilize all of them. Blind insertions are one thing, but once again, it goes back to you have to know the anatomy. Um, if you're doing a blind insertion, you've got to know where the esophagus is and you got to know where the trachea is. Um, so, and you got to know what you're feeling if you're utilizing a bougie. You know, if you go in and you're in the esophagus, you're not going to feel those ridges, where if you're in the trachea, you should feel those ridges. So that's pretty much it for innovation. Uh, anything else from anybody on innovation that they want to bring forward? Bacon, you got anything on the QA, QI angle, documentation wise, anything that we've seen? Uh, no, nothing. Something that you really haven't already hit on is, you know, more detailed in your, with your assessment documentation, stuff like that, but yeah, you, you hit on it already, so. Okay. Um, anything from anybody else out there? Um, like I said, I, I think, I, I don't think Becker's off today. Becker should be there. Becker's in a beta, a lot of people. He's probably got the highest um, success rate. So anything on, on your end, Becker, on things that help you or tricks that you use, same thing with Burr, um, Ricky, you know, all, all the people that have been doing this for a while and done several innovations, um, feel free to throw anything out there that helps you guys that can help other people. Hey, Chief, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. So one thing I've uh, talked with Lucy about is uh, setting yourself up for success. So I'm a big proponent of innovating in the medic because you can get them where you want them as far as head placement, but also uh, taking the time, you know, if you've got a rest to get the patient to where you need them, you know, moving them and uh, putting them to where they're going to be in the best spot to innovate. Okay, I'll give you two things on that. Um, I 100% I, I agree with you. Um, I agree with everything you're saying. The only thing I'll add to that is we just need to make sure that we're managing the airway prior to getting under the medic. So that's one thing we do see a lot of in the QA is that uh, we, we take that approach, but we don't manage the airway while we're trying to package someone in a house to a cot, out the front door, through the yard, out to the medic. 
we're letting them not oxygenate, not, not have appropriate ventilation. So yeah, I agree with you on that end is sometimes the medic is the best option for you. Uh, again, I, I like your terminology of setting yourself up, up for success. Um, the other thing I will say is uh, for like JC and those guys, uh, Ricky, anybody that worked with me at Harrison Township, one of my standard tools that we always had on any time that we were gonna have to innovate somebody is I better had a sheet or blanket there. Because first of all, um, the one thing I would go against being in the medic is a lot of times I have, I'm able to get better positioning if, I, if I'm not in the medic. So if you're comfortable with that, hey, I'm all for that. I'm not saying you're wrong at all. But for me, it was, I was, uh, had much better success if I'm able to lay down at the head of the patient while they're supine and I can get at head level with them. Um, some people are more comfortable being above their head versus flat with their head. So again, I think that is a, a personal choice and a personal preference. I am 100% in agreement with you. If, if that's what sets you up, obviously that works for you. Um, but I can also tell you one of my tricks is I'd much rather be flat on my belly at the patient's head. I get a much better view, especially if I've got to get grade three or four there, where if I can get down lower, I'm better off. But hey, that, that you, you make a, a very good point there. Anything else from anybody? Okay, uh, just going to STI just for a little bit here. Um, again, I think this is something over the years we've gotten uh, really, really good at. Um, and it goes back into innovation as, as well. But um, do we understand and have full understanding of, of how we should be doing this. and Are we following the procedure and protocol 100% how we should be? So I, I, I'll go back to, this is Atomidate's another one of those tools that we have, which I think is a very good tool. Um, and it should be our go-to, our number one for those, for having to secure airways on our semi-conscious patients. Um, I'll go back to this versus a nasal innovation. Nasal innovation is a tool we have and there's nothing wrong with it. However, I think STI is a, is a much, much more um, definitive and definite airway. Um, if you take someone in that's nasally innovated into the hospital and they're going to be maintained on a vent, they're going to end up switching out that tube. So if we can just get it right from the get-go, we're better off there. I think you also are going to have less complications with STI and Atomidate versus some of our other options. Um, we have had talks about uh, paralytics here in the future, which I am 100% uh, um, for and looking into. Uh, I'm not there yet with everybody, but uh, as we move forward and do more and more training, I am, I am all about talking with the docs, talking with the chiefs, and, and looking at paralytics because I think paralytics have their place in pre-hospital for us as well. Uh, but going, continuing going with STI is um, we put cheat cards in with our, with our Atomidate, um, utilize the cheat cards. Um, I've heard a lot of things, everything from everybody gets one dose, uh, you know, a certain milligrams, or we use a 30 and 40 dose. Um, I am going to urge people to go away from that. Um, I, I agree with you that most of our patients are going to fall within that, that realm, but we put the cheat cards there for a reason. And we really do need to be dosing these people appropriately. Now, when I say appropriately, I'm also a firm believer that um, a little extra bump of Atomidate helps you out tremendously. Now, when I say that, um, I will say we just need to have, we should probably have the practice of maybe overestimating their weight versus <laughs> overdosing them. That's not what I'm looking for. Is if, if you have a 250 pound patient, we may be best saying, yeah, they're a 275 pound patient and they get a little bit of an extra bump of Atomidate. Um, I think that helps you out. I've seen a lot of cases where we've got the, if we actually put the patient on a scale and did their exact weight, that that isn't quite enough for them. Um, and they either don't go, we don't get them completely sedated um, or it wears off tremendously quick. 
So I will, I will use the terminology, make sure we are appropriately gauging their weight. And if it's much, much better to go have them a little bit heavier than lighter. Um, but utilize the cheat cards and actually utilize the correct dose of what we should be giving them. Um, contraindications. Uh, we talk a lot about this and depends on where you look at what the contraindications are. Uh, but there really aren't a whole lot, if any, contraindications for automidate other than uh, sensitivity to automidate. We've had it brought up before about pregnant patients. And yes, pregnant patients isn't necessarily a contraindication. It's you have to be aware that if you give it to a patient, a uh, pregnancy patient, understand that it's not, that's not just going to affect the mother, that is going to affect the child. So does the airway, does securing the airway of your pregnant female patient, um, does that is that more important than the, the possible counter, the possible um, side effect to the child? If the mom's not breathing and we have to secure an airway, well, then yes, then we need to make sure we're securing that airway. But we can be a little bit more hesitant when it comes to uh, pregnant females, and we should be. Um, we can have some hy hypotension with automidate, but it's normally very minimal. Um, so we can, if we have someone that is severely hypotensive, understand that we can drop them down a, a little bit more. Um, however, very, very few, if any at all, contraindications for automity. Side effects. So probably the biggest side effect that we see, we've talked about hypo hypotension there a little bit, but once again, that's very minimal. Um, the other side effect that we probably see most often with automity is trismus. Or, um, that, that muscle activity we're, we're actually uh, clenching down of the jaw. Um, most of the time, we're going to see this with two types of patients. Um, head injury patients, that is very uh, common in. The other time we're going to see this is if we push automidate too quick. Um, automidate is a slow IV push. Um, I can tell you that I've heard one to two minutes to me, that's still a little bit long for automidate. Um, I think that is the, the true uh, slow IV push. I think it's one, supposed to be one to two minutes. However, um, you, you truly don't need to spread it out over two minutes because if you spread it out over two minutes, you're going to end up having to redose them because I think that's just uh, too long and, too, and it's got too short of a half-life with, with, with automidate. Also understand that we can uh, redose these patients at the, at the same initial dose. That's why we carry extra automidate. Um, so if we go in once and can't get it, there's a very good possibility that we have to redose them and that's fine. Just make sure we're documenting that. Um, the other thing I'll put in with this is, uh, which I, I, I'll say now and I'll go to the next screen, um, your Versed dosages. Understand your Versed dosages are two milligrams at a time. There's no max dose to that. So we can end up using all of our verse set on these patients, but it truly is supposed to be two milligrams at a time. Um, the other aspect I will say to that is use some critical thinking to that, is if you do innovate that semi-conscious patient and they're somebody that's 350 pounds, two milligrams of verse set may not touch that patient. So um, understand we may have to give them a little bit more or do two milligrams followed by another quick two milligrams. Um, it's all about the sedation of that patient and keep them from fighting the tooth. Uh, but also understand depending on where you are within the collaborative, you've only got so much Versed. So you want to make sure that we're not dosing them too quick, too much, and that we can make that Versed last. Um, let me go to the next. So a couple other things when it comes to innovations or STI is a lot of times we forget that we also have the use and it's in our protocol to utilize lidocaine for our conscious patients or those individuals that we think possibly have some ICP. Um, if that's the case, utilize your lidocaine. 
Um, you can nebulize it or you can give it to them IN. Um, if we're doing it IN, it's half in one nostril, half in the, uh, in the other nostril. And this goes back to working as a team again. As you are setting your innovation equipment up and someone is pre-oxygenating the patient, someone else can be grabbing the lidocaine and a MAD device and make that happen as well. And that's not only working on the ICP angle, but it's also working to help uh, anesthetize the area for the innovation and help, can help you with some, uh, some vocal cord spasms and everything else. So um, make sure that's something I think slips almost all of our minds is we get so concentrated on the innovation that we forget about the, the prep that we can do for that innovation. Um, the other thing that we have available to us, once again, hey, we BC, have a, I got a question about the the use of Versed versus Ketamine when you look at the protocol. Okay. Yep, Nick's actually gonna specifying go blood pressure versus not. Uh, you know, like it says, if it's over 100, you got to use a Versed. Under 100, you use the Ketamine. Yep. But you can still use Ketamine even though your blood pressure is over 100. Absolutely. Uh, that was actually the next thing I was going to hit is on is on ketamine. So uh, yeah, anytime we do have someone that's finding a tube that's hypotensive, we're bypassing that Versed, that midazolam, and we're going to ketamine. We should be going to ketamine. Um, ket ketamine won't have the hypotensive effects that Versed can and will have. Um, so 100% on the ketamine. Um, I still think that our go-to for the most should be midazolam. And once again, I think that's going to be a that's that's going to be a paramedic preference. Uh, I haven't had good luck with ketamine, so I'm, I'm not hesitant to use it, but if I have, if their pressure is maintained, then I'm gonna use Versed all day long. Um, however, if you do have that long transport and we run out of Versed, we can go to ketamine. Uh, that's not a problem. So either one of those are options for you, and um, it, there's not, uh, I, I'm not gonna say you should be using one over the other, except when it comes to uh, blood pressure. So we have to look at the blood pressure, but if you're someone that is a fan of ketamine and likes ketamine and has had good luck with ketamine, understand you can use ketamine for that patient. Um, anything else on that? Uh, bacon, and, and I know we've talked about this. Is there anything else that you can think of on the STI innovation angle when it comes to drugs, state to innovate anything. Oh, uh, the other thing I see on there that I, I, I know that we, along with lidocaine, uh, the intranasal lidocaine or nebulized lidocaine, uh, a lot of us also forget or bypass lidocaine jelly, which again is, is okay, but it's, it's another item up there that's going to help you along the way when it comes to laryngospasm and, and vocal cords slamming shut. So different factors there that could help you as well. And uh, just remember before we move into the last two parts of this is the other thing that's mentioned here in the last bullet point is, uh, and or it doesn't affect everybody in the collaborative yet, but uh, understand that our, our surgical crikes are a very, very last attempt after everything else, every other airway attempt has failed, which we'll hit here in a second. So auto vents, uh, this is something else that uh, Lieutenant Shaning and I and Lieutenant Bacon and I have talked about a little bit over the past couple weeks and something that I've noticed, and it's just been differences between the departments and the collaboratives, um, but uh, um, I, I've kind of said my piece on this, and I wanted to bring it up in this training, is that we have auto vents, which are, are very, very good tools. I, I look at an auto vent the same way that I look at a Lucas device, is that it is supplying a mechanical option for us and not only alleviating a crew member, but it's providing the most effective and efficient care versus a human being. Um, it is a um, tool that can be utilized to supply the exact amount and correct ventilation rate and tidal volume to that patient and oxygenation to that patient. So it is a tool that 
I am asking that we utilize and get in place as soon as possible on these patients. And the reason for that is, and there's studies out there for it, and I urge you to just watch our crews when we're managing these people's airways uh, with a BVM, uh, whether it is with an ET tube or with a mask, watch how our individuals bag. Uh, because first thing is, is it's almost impossible to get the exact correct tidal volume that we want to get into these patients. You know, it's one thing, you know, there's a big difference between a two hands on a bag versus one hand on a bag. Um, most of our, uh, majority of our bag valve masks are set up for what I will refer to as one hand ventilation. So as I squeeze a bag with one hand, that is supplying the most appropriate amount of tidal volume to that patient versus a two hands on a bag where we're emptying out a complete bag, which is much, much more than what needs to go to that patient. Um, where if I can get that auto vent on somebody and I got the uh, tidal volume set or preset or can change that tidal volume, same thing with the rate, um, that is a much, much more effective and efficient ventilation and oxygenation of that patient than somebody on a bag valve mask. Um, I urge you to watch people because you'll see that we are um, ventilating them at a rate that is much more than what they actually need and should be. We're actually hyperventilating these patients most of the time and the tidal volume is all over the place when we're util utilizing bag valve masks. So I urge people as much as possible to make this a tool that we have with us inside if we're innovating or managing people's um, ventilations inside a building, inside a house, that we get this on as soon as possible after we secure someone's innovations. Because again, it frees up a crew member. Uh, during these COVID times, again, it takes us away from that close contact with the patient right there. And um, when we're talking about aerosol generating procedures, and it's providing them with the best possible care, just like the Lucas device would do. Okay, so for the last part of this, talk just a little bit about surgical crikes here. Um, again, for Inglewood, for Inglewood and Union, uh, JC actually just brought up a good point. It says you're actually also able to um, titrate it a lot, lot better, much, much better with your caponography with an auto vent versus bagging. Um, so that JC, that's a very, very good point uh, when it comes to utilizing your caponography and your auto vent together uh, and, and managing, managing that patient's uh, airway overall. So very good point. Uh, surgical crikes, um, something that Inglewood and Union aren't capable of doing yet. But my goal for this, and our goal for this, on the, with the with this this shift, EMS shift with the docs, is to get this all taken care of by the first of the year, and be able to have surgical crikes capabilities of surgical crikes in place for all the medic units and all personnel. Um, that's a process we're going to be working through to get everyone trained and competent and and comfortable and checked off by us and the medical directors. Uh, but we're working through that process as we speak. Uh, but I thought I would just hit a, a little bit on it here to give you guys a, a preview. And uh, for the Clayton people that have been doing this for a while, a little bit of review for you guys. So number one is when should this procedure be performed? Uh, some of that we've hit on already. Um, this is going to be any time. This is our, our, our final step our last step to utilize when we have to secure an airway on somebody, uh, that all other attempts are either incapable of happening or have been attempted and failed. Um, so I will go to uh, most important, one of the most important factors on this is you have to know anatomy and landmarks on this. If you don't know anatomy and landmarks on this, um, it can be disastrous. And I wish every patient that we had to do a, a surgical crike on looked like this picture because it would be easy as can be, uh, but they're not. Um, so the biggest thing to make sure we're looking for 
is once again, um, let me, I'm going to go back here real quick. So once again, is being able to look for that thyroid cartilage, the cricoid cartilage, and find the cricoid membrane in between the two. Because that cricoid membrane is where your incision and your tube is going to be passed. Um, so those structures are the three um, most important and common structures that we need to be able to locate, determine, find, um, before we do anything else with this patient. And I'm sorry, the other thing you'll see is that cricoid membrane, and I, it's a little hard to see there, but where the tube is passing uh, on the bottom picture um, is the cricoid membrane. And you can see you have the bony cartilage structures above and below at the, uh, that with the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage, and it's the membrane right between there. And once again, the easiest way to pick that out, even on yourself, is your fingernail can actually slip into that, and that's where how you can actually find it on yourself between your thyroid cartilage and your uh, cricoid cartilage. Um, so virtually the two bumps on his neck right there that you see in this picture is where we're going to make that incision. Uh, most of the time they're calling it a three centimeter um, incision, but virtually you're looking at a half an inch to an inch incision here. Um, and then being able to go down, uh, make an incision through the membrane, which should put you into the trachea. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all the mechanics of this. Uh, we'll do that in a later training, uh, but ma make sure you've got all your tools and equipment there, which our Crite kits have everything that you're going to need. Uh, the Crite kits that we have here in Clayton actually have a, I think it's a six tube. It's either a six or a six and a half tube, but I think it's a six tube that's cut down. Um, you can also use a Shiley tube. Uh, we just, we don't purchase those. We've got the, the six tubes, which are cuff tubes, which virtually provide the same thing for us. Um, hemostats, a syringe, a tie, um, and uh, iodine solution to, to uh, cleanse the area prior to doing it. Um, the other thing it has in there is some four by fours and stuff like that. Complications with it is uh, uh, there's some obvious complications. Uh, once again, going back to not having your landmarks is a huge complication. If you're making incisions without knowing what your landmarks are, it's going to be disastrous. You're going to have bleeding with this, um, capillary bleeding mostly, um, but that can be, uh, you can have a lot of blood or can look overwhelming at times, um, but most of the time that's just capillary blood and it's not going to be an issue. Um, Anatomy and, and airway makeups can be huge complications on this. You have that uh, individual, that top left picture with all the different airways that I showed you earlier with the big 400-pound uh, guy with no neck or all kinds of fatty adipose tissue around their neck. This is going to be very, very difficult to do a surgical crike. It's not possible. It's just very, very difficult. Um, so once again, I, I'll just go back to, I got two videos here. I'll show you for on some crikes, um, on the next slide, but this is something we're going to hit in the near future and give everyone a lot more training on it to get people checked off on it. Um, not something you need to worry about tremendously right now. So as I bring up this video, I'm going to, give me one second here. I'm going to bring it over here so you can actually see it. Is that on everyone's screen? We got no video, she followed. Okay, hold on here. So this isn't on your guys' screen. Give me one second here. Change my screen. Is it there now? Uh, yeah, hit the play button. Okay. Yeah, there you go. What's up?
two videos here of actual of actual surgical crikes. So we'll talk about them here after they get done. They're short videos. Okay, so uh, once again, that was uh, just to, to show you the mechanics of it again. I mean, that was a pretty quick down and dirty surgical crike within an emergency room um, of an individual. And I, I've got no clue what the uh, background on that is and, and why they weren't able to get the tube, um, what the issues were with the laryngoscope blade with the doc that was trying to get the tube there. But um, it at least gives you the mechanics so you can actually see um, you know, pretty much an inch incision uh, vertically between the thyroid cartilage and the, and the cricoid cartilage. And then you could actually see when they stuck his finger down in to feel that membrane, and then they went back in with a scalpel to puncture that membrane. Um, there's nothing to say, once again, that the other tools that we have available to us, i.e. a Muji, uh, can come into play with this as well, um, which I think you'll see in the next video. But both of these videos, you know, aren't there to scare you into never doing one of these. It's to show you that this other one's a little bit more uh, a complicated case. Um, this one was pretty down and dirty. Individual wasn't really uh, overweight, didn't have a whole lot of fatty tissue uh, in his neck area. Um, it's pretty down and dirty and simple. Uh, so this next one's a little bit, a little bit more different. A second here and I'll move it over again. The last 30 seconds of this video is of a dramatic, Ouija aided emergency cricothyroidotomy. This procedure will require some introduction. This will be the first one minute and 20 seconds of this video. A man with type 2 diabetes who had recently had two teeth extractions presented to the emergency department with a submental abscess. He was brought to the operating room for an incision and drainage procedure. On rapid sequence induction of anesthesia, a Glidescope video laryngoscope was placed into the airway and the larynx was initially visualized. The egg cower suction was used to remove some secretions in the hypopharynx. And suddenly, the entire hypopharynx filled with a whitish fluid. The anesthesiologist, unable to see the larynx, placed a laryngeal mask airway and was able to partially ventilate the patient. The surgical team was prompted to perform an emergency cricothyroidomy. This procedure proved to be difficult. Though the cricothyroid membrane and larynx was eventually identified, no end tidal carbon dioxide could be detected on multiple placements of a shyly like tracheostomy tube catheter. It was determined that the shyly catheter was being placed in a false passage, 
a gum elastic bougie was secured and placed into the cricothyronomy incision. Backward and forward movements of the gum elastic bougie allowed the operator to feel the tracheal rings. And a small 6.5 internal diameter tracheal tube was advanced into the airway. Okay, so that one, uh, again, gives you some complications that you can see. Um, that false passage that he was talking about is virtually, uh, as they make that incision, uh, even though they may have punctured the membrane, uh, they are still, as they slide in the tube, don't slide into the trachea, but slide down past the trachea or on either side of the trachea, and they're virtually just into that uh, fatty tissue on either side of the trachea. Um, so once again, this uh, a surgical crike, it's a surgical procedure. There can be all kinds of complications from it, but it is a last ditch uh, effort for us to actually get a, um, an airway and secure an airway on that patient. Um, if anybody has got anything on surgical crikes, and I'll let John jump in here. Um, John did actually the last surgical crike that we had within the collaborative. So if John's got anything to say on this, good, bad, indifferent experience. Um, I've done uh, one with the aid of a quick trach, which suck. Um, and if anybody else has ever done one, anxious to hear anything that you guys have to say on it. Once again, that can help us going forward with some of the things that we need to concentrate on when we do our training on these for everybody in the collaborative. Anybody? Anybody? John, you got anything at all? Not really. Uh, the only thing I was saying in here was it's pretty much uh, lined up with the pig trach training we do. Okay. Other than the fact you can't see your landmark, it feels the same and scaffold works the same. Okay. Anybody else have anything? Um, if not, that's all I've got. Um, I hope that this at least provided something to you. Like I said, I put it together last minute because our training got canceled by, by Kettering. So I hope it was uh, somewhat beneficial and at least provide you with something. So um, if anybody's got anything else? If not, we'll call it an end and uh, talk to you guys later. Thank you.